Hello friends, this is chapter 12 of The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind, and chapter 12 is titled, Bigger and Brighter. As I explained to Rose, without wind there was no light. On calm, still nights we were stuck in the dark with our kerosene lanterns. The only way to change this was by finding a car battery, but until one came along I found other uses for the windmill, like charging mobile phones. I discovered this when my cousin Ruth visited from Mizuru. Ruth and Uncle Socr Ruth was Uncle Socrates' oldest daughter, who was married and had a good job. She also had a cell phone. She was always bugging me to charge it down at the trading center. Some guys in the market were making loads of money charging phones for people who had no electricity in their homes. They cut deals with shopkeepers who allowed them to run long extension cords to the roadside where they set up a little stall. They sold scratch cards with airtime minutes. Some <clears throat> even had mobile phones that people could use to make calls, like a payphone. I later discovered that these kinds of stalls were found all over Africa, in bigger cities such as uh, Nairobi and Lilongwe and uh, Kinshasa. Some guys even powered photocopiers, computers, and printers this way, letting people prepare their work resumes and call about jobs, all on the sidewalk. Of course, the frequent blackouts in these cities were never good for business. Anyway, one day I was complaining about having to take Ruth's phone to the trading center when she said, why don't you charge it with your windmill? It produces electricity, right? I'd already considered this, but the dynamo didn't generate enough voltage to power a phone. It produced 12 volts, which is fine for light bulbs and smaller things, when a charger needed 220 volts. If you remember, while testing the radio, I discovered that energy decreases when passing through wire over long distances. But to charge a phone, I'd need something to boost the power, something called a step-up transformer. Electric companies around the world, especially in Europe and America, step up power all the time because electricity gets lost on the journey from the power station to your home. The company installs transformers along the way that add that extra boost. It's like giving your electricity some coffee and donuts to keep it going. A step-up transformer has two coils, the primary and secondary, located on either side of a core. Alternating current flows back and forth and causes the primary coil to induce a charge in the second coil. This process is called mutual induction, which means that voltage from one coil jumps to another. The result is that the overall voltage increases. I learned this from explaining physics in a chapter called Mutual Induction and Transformers, which showed a picture of a man with white hair and a bow tie. This was Michael Faraday, who invented the first transformer in 1831. Cheers to that guy, I thought. Using the diagrams, I was determined to make my own step-up transformer. First, I borrowed a pair of wire cutters, and, a, and I cut an iron sheet into an E pattern. The diagram showed how to boost 24 volts into 220. It explained how voltage increased with each turn of the wire, how the primary coil needed 200 turns while the secondary coil needed 2,000. Next, next to it was a bunch of mathematical equations, but I paid them no mind. I started rapping like mad and hoped it worked. I then connected the dynamo wires to the primary coil, while the secondary coil was wired directly to the prongs of a phone charger. Ruth stood over me, eyebrows raised. Don't blow it up, she said. I lied. I know what I'm doing. When I plugged in the phone jack, the screen brightened and the bars began moving up and down. It worked! See, I told you. <laughs> to make things easier, I built a plug using the AC outlet from an old radio, which I fixed in the wall like a normal electric socket. When news of this invention reached the trading center, the line of people waiting to charge their phones reached the road. Many people who came still pretended not to believe me, probably in hopes that I wouldn't charge them money. They said, are you sure this electric wind can charge my phone? I'm positive. Prove it. See, it charges. My God, you're right. But leave it for a little longer. I'm still not convinced. After two months of using this method, I finally went bigger. I was over at Charity's one day and spotted an actual car battery sitting in the corner. I found it yesterday on the road, he said. Just pay me when you can. From studying my books, I knew that car batteries use DC power. So if I wanted to charge it using my dynamo, which spit out AC power, I'd have to find a way to convert it. 
My book talked about diodes or rectifiers, which are found in many radios and electronic devices, and they convert this power for you. The kind of diode I needed looked like, it looked like a tiny D-cell battery on a long metal skewer. The side of it reminded me of smoked mice kebabs that boys sold along the highway as snacks. After studying the picture, I easily found one inside an old 6-volt radio in Jeffrey's room. I fashioned a soldering iron from a piece of heated cable, then fused the diode to the wire between the windmill and the car battery. Come Kwamba, I thought to myself, you are one clever chap. But not so fast, because doing this created a new kind of problem. The phone charging plug in my wall only worked with AC power. I puzzled over this for several days and searched every book for the answer. Finally, my cousin Ruth solved it in the simplest of ways. She gave me a phone charger that plugs inside your car, one that uses DC power. After making some modifications to the wires, I had a new wall jack. With the phone charger out of the way, I now focused on the bigger task of lighting. Armed with the car battery, I was able to install three additional bulbs in the house. I couldn't use normal incandescent bulbs because they only work with AC power, so I had to find alternatives. At Mr. Dowd's shop, I found three car bulbs, a brake light, and two front headlights. I kept the dynamo bulb in my room, which worked on both AC and DC powder power. I installed one car bulb above my door outside, one in my parents' bedroom, and another in the living room. When the battery was fully charged, the lights could work for three days without wind. The bulbs connected directly to the battery with wires and operated on a parallel circuit. I learned about this from explaining physics, which demonstrated two kinds of circuits, parallel and series. In a series circuit, one wire connects every bulb in the battery, or whatever source you're using, in a single path. To complete the circuit, all the bulbs need to be working. If one bulb burns out, None of them will work. Some types of Christmas lights used to be this way. When several bulbs have to be powered by a single battery, as in a car lighting system, the book explained, the usual practice is to connect the bulbs in parallel. The book showed how the homes in Britain were wired this way. Each bulb is connected with, a, with separate wires and has its own circuit. If one bulb burns out, the rest will still work. It went on to say that bulbs arranged in parallel can have independent switches. A diagram on the next page illustrated the basic design for a light switch. It seemed easy enough, so I built my own using bicycle spokes and strips of iron. For the toggles, or the switch, I wanted a good non-conductive material I could shape the way I wanted. So taking my knife, I carved out several round buttons from a pair of old flip-flops and then mounted them inside small boxes I'd made from melted PVC pipe. I rigged my switch like I'd seen in the books, with a wire leading from the power supply to the bulb and the switch in the middle to complete or break the circuit. It was simple. Whenever I pushed the flip-flop button, the spoke and iron connected the terminals. Finally, I said, I can touch the wall and get light. Not long after wiring the house, I walked into the living room one night and found my family sitting together. My mother was busy crocheting a beautiful orange tablecloth while my father and sisters were engrossed in a news program on Radio 1. I pretended to be one of the reporters and barged in with my microphone, speaking in a deep, serious voice. I am standing in the living room of the Honorable Mr. Kungkwamba. Sir, this room used to be so dark and sad at this hour. Now look at you, enjoying electricity like a city person. Oh, my father said, smiling, enjoying it more than a city person. You mean because you there are no blackouts and you owe SCOM nothing? Well, yes, he said. And also, because my own son made it. Having lights in my home was a remarkable improvement, but it also had its problems. My battery and wires were not the best quality, and in fact, they were kind of scary. I'd used up all the good copper wire that Charity had given me, so all I had left were bits of stuff I'd found in the scrapyard and trash bins. Some of this wire was never meant to conduct electricity, but I used it anyway. I tied all the pieces together until it looked like one of those escape ropes that prisoners fashioned from bed sheets. It wasn't covered in plastic insulation either, like true electrical wire, so it sparked whenever I touched it to the battery. I had strung this mangy, this mangy network to the walls and ceiling, which was made from wood and grass, trying not to cross any wires and send my whole house up in flames. To make matters worse, the termites were having a party in the wooden beams in my ceiling. 
Each night I went to bed listening to the sounds of their tiny jaws and woke up the next morning to piles of sawdust on the floor. Their ferocious appetites had finally hollowed the beams and caused them to sag. It wasn't long before this nearly caused a disaster. After a big storm one afternoon, I returned from Jeffrey's house and discovered the beam had finally snapped, probably from the wind. The ceiling now caved in the middle of and the now caved in the middle and my floor was covered in dirt and grass. The broken beam had also dumped hundreds of squirming termites onto the floor and across my bed. At first I tried sweeping them off, but there were too many. My father had managed to buy a few more chickens, and as I looked out of my open door, I saw a gang of them walking past. Come here, chickens, I called out. Do I have a treat for you? I tossed a few termites out the door to lure them in. Once they realized what a great bounty awaited them inside my room, they went crazy with hunger. Soon my floor and bed were filled with chickens squawking and flapping their wings and as they pecked the helpless insects. This incident caused such a commotion that I didn't even notice the burnt smell. After the chickens cleared out, I looked closely at the broken beam and saw that my wires had crossed during the collapse. Luckily, they were so cheap and thin, they'd simply melted and snapped in two. I thanked God that no one had been hurt. When Jeffrey arrived later to help pick up the mess, I told him, It's a good thing I'm too poor to buy quality wire. If I'd used anything better, I'd have burned up my home. I warned you about that roof, he said. Sure, sure, but I didn't listen. I needed a proper wiring system. So as always, I turned to explaining physics for ideas. On page 271, I found a good model. A diagram showed a utility system in a home in England, wired in parallel like mine. After the wires left the power supply, they entered a fuse box whose job was to shut down the circuit if it ever overloaded. I needed something like this. The fuses contained tiny metal filaments that melted whenever the overload occurred, but I didn't have any of those, nor did I want them, as the fuses had to be replaced each time. The book went on to describe a similar device called a circuit breaker, which used switches that could be reset. They didn't offer a drawing, but the concept seemed similar to an electric bell, which I'd studied in, t in detail. In most parts of the world, electric bells are found all over the place, at schools and at railroad crossings and fire alarms, and at one time in telephones. The concept is amazingly simple, which is why I loved it so much. It works like this. A coil becomes magnetized and pulls a metal hammer that strikes a gong. That's it. However, during this striking position, this striking motion, the hammer also trips a switch that breaks the circuit. It does this about a dozen times per second, giving the bell its ring. I started, my, I started by making a breaker box from PVC pipe. Next, I wrapped the heads of two nails with copper wire to create two electromagnetic coils. I mounted these inside the box with the coils facing each other about five inches apart. Coming up between them, I wired a small bar magnet, which I'd busted off a radio speaker, to a piece of bicycle spoke where it to where it looked like a lollipop. This magnet lollipop could tick-tock back and forth between the two coiled nails. I then removed the little spring from a ballpoint pen and stretched it out. I positioned it between the lollipop magnet and nail to where it rested lightly against the wire leading to the battery. Basically, this spring completed the circuit and acted as a kind of trap. When the light was turned on like normal, the electricity flowed from the battery into the circuit and magnetized my two nail coils one of which was slightly closer to the lollipop. The polarity is determined by which direction the current runs, so I wrapped the nails with wire so that the closest one to the lollipop pushed while the other nail pulled. This pushing and pulling kept the lollipop balanced in the center, never knowing what to do. In the event of a power surge, the balance would be broken. The coil closer to the lollipop would receive the surge first and push it hard against the other coil, knocking the pin spring loose and breaking the circuit. As you can imagine, this was tricky to build. I spent hours trying to position the coil and lollipop magnets just right and determine the best place for the tripwire. Once it was finally done, I nailed the breaker box to my wall just above the battery. Each night, I sat on my bed and stared at it, waiting for it to work. I got my wish about two weeks later when a cyclone hit my house. I'd spent all day in the trading center and returned to find bits and pieces of my thatch roof lying in the yard. When my mother came out from the kitchen, I asked what happened. A big cyclone just came from the fields. We had to run inside. I entered my room and saw that the roof had collapsed. 
Parts of the ceiling were all over the floor. I also noticed that the circuit breaker had flit and the lollipop was now stuck against one of the coils. I tried moving it back to the middle, but it refused and just kept swinging back to the nail. After disconnecting the battery, I followed my wires along the ceiling and discovered they'd become tangled in the, high, in the cyclone winds. Once I separated them and reconnected the battery, the lollipop returned to the center. Once again, I'd narrowly escaped a fire. But of course, I was more excited about my circuit breaker than anything. Mr. Jeffrey, do you realize what this means? My house would be ashes right now. All of my clothes and blankets and books, everything would be gone. My circuit breaker saved the day. Your circuit breaker is great, he agreed. But I think the better solution is to fix your roof. Any new invention is going to have problems, and aside from the patchy wiring, one of my biggest headaches was the bike chain. Whenever the wind blew really hard and spun the blades, the chain would snap or simply jump off the teeth of the crank set, forcing me to climb the tower to fix it. This required stopping the blades, which was always painful. One morning, I was enjoying a deep sleep when a terrible racket forced me awake. The chain had broken again. I heard the wind whipping the tree and my tower rocking back and forth. I could tell the blades were spinning so fast they were buzzing on the rotor. If I didn't fix them soon, they could snap off and fly through the air like daggers. Outside, I climbed the first set of rungs, and as usual, I kicked off my flip-flop so I could get a better grip. But the wind was violent and angry, rocking the tower so hard that I thought it would tip. Looking up, I saw the chain dancing loose over the crank set while the blade spun wild. When I reached the top, I wrapped my legs around the rungs for support. But in trying to keep my balance, I didn't see the bicycle frame swing toward me. Before I could react, the wind sent the blade straight into my head, into my hand. The impact knocked me off my feet, and I barely managed to hold on. Looking down, all I saw was blood. Three of my knuckles were now missing their skin. You are my own creation, I shouted to my windmill. So why are you trying to destroy me? Please, let me help you. From my pocket, I pulled a strip of bicycle tire that I'd bought for su brought for such repairs. I wrapped it around my palm like a protective glove, held my breath, and grabbed hold of the spinning sprocket. The jagged teeth cut into the rubber like a saw blade. Stop! Once everything was still, I shoved a bent bicycle spoke into the wheel to keep the machine from spinning, then reattached the chain. A few days later, when it happened again, I wasn't so lucky. The teeth on the sprocket cut through the tire rubber and ripped my flesh. Then it happened again. My hands are covered in scars. During this time, Jeffrey was still working with Uncle Musawali at the maize mill in Chipumba. He'd been hired to sweep the floors and fetch things for the business. But once Jeffrey arrived, our uncle would disappear into town and make him run the mill on his own. It was hard and thankless work. About once a month, he came home and complained about his new work life, his new life as a working man. He forces me to ride my bike up five hills and get and get diesel, Jeffrey said. And on the way back, the fuel soaks my clothes. I'm telling you, brother, I'm missing you guys terribly. But he also described how the grinding machines in the mill worked by using pulleys and rubber belts. You can solve your chain problem if you use a belt. We use them at the mill and they never fail. This was great news. A pulley was just what I needed to increase the tension between the front and back sprockets. Let's see. A pulley was just what I needed to increase the tension between the front and back sprockets of my crank set, which was the reason the chain kept flying off. Also, a belt didn't require constant grease. In the scrapyard, I easily found two pulleys from an old water pumping engine. I used a piece of heavy steel to snap their cotter pins and slide them off the machine. But... The center hole of the larger pulley was too big for my shaft, so I had to weld it alongside the sprocket itself. These days, Mr. Goodson no longer made fun of me. Whenever he saw me walking up, holding these random pieces, he just smiled and fired up his torch. Tell me where. Mr. Goodson even let me use his grinder to flatten all those sharp teeth on the sprocket until its edges were smooth. This is for all my scars, I said as they disappeared under a shower of sparks. The pulleys worked great but I didn't have a proper belt. Jeffrey had promised to try and bring me one, but in the meantime, I cut the handle off an old nylon bag and rigged it around the pulleys. It worked for about 10 seconds before slipping off. I even cut open a few batteries and removed the aluminum chloride jelly, which I'd first read about in my books, hoping it would act as a glue. 
but it wore away after a few hours. An old man in the trading center gave me an actual belt from a milling machine, which he'd used to fashion, fasten vegetables to his bike. The belt, the belt was broken, so I tried mending it with my crochet needle and carbon fiber from a truck tire. It didn't last long, but with nothing else, I used this system for two months. Finally, Jeffrey returned from Chim Chipumba with a good belt that worked beautifully. At last, no more injuries on the job. Even better, no more getting out of bed in the mornings to climb the tower. Instead, when the rooster stirred me from my dreams in the early mornings, which he always did, the steady hum of the machine sang me back to sleep. But sometimes that rooster was a persistent guy, and not even my windmill could guarantee my rest. Chicken! I screamed. If you don't shut up, it'll be your skinny neck spinning from those blades. cock a doodle doo It was no use. Conquering darkness on the farm was hard enough, but a noisy chicken? That was impossible. That is the end of chapter 12.